All right. Good morning. Okay, am I on? You guys can hear me from the speakers? All right, good morning. Um, a little different, right? Watching it played out as opposed to me reading it and you trying to envision and imagine kind of the things that are going on. I know it was a little cheesy. And by the way, yes, that's the guy that plays in Lost. Um, he was playing Jesus. <laughs> um, so for those of you guys, I know that guy from somewhere. Yeah, he's the guy that was like, always said brother somehow or another. Um, before I start, let me pray and then we'll, we'll get into to this. Father, uh, thank you for your word, whether it's written whether it's read, I'm sorry, whether it's read, whether it's spoken, or whether it's dramatized, it's still your word, and we're grateful for it. Um, we pray today that you would use your word um, to speak to your people, that your word would bring life, and that your word would bring encouragement, and that your word would bring peace and comfort. Pray this in Christ's name, amen. All right. By way of intro introduction, before I get started with anything in this passage, let me explain what we just saw. Um, this is a story that you guys saw, obviously, about a woman that was caught in adultery, that was uh, going to be stoned by, uh, because she was caught and brought before Jesus, and he was brought in to be tempted. Now, before uh, we get into that and unpack that, uh, something that I have to say is that if you notice, if you read your Bibles and you followed along, you notice that that was kind of double bracketed in your scriptures. Um, maybe it was in the footnote of your scripture. Maybe it just wasn't there altogether, depending on the translations that you read. And there's debate among scholars as to whether or not these 11 verses, or these 12 verses, I should say, were, were actually part of the original manuscripts that were included in the book of John. Now, I don't have time to go in this morning into all of the minutia, the, the literary reasons why I think the, the story should or shouldn't be in the book of John. But I do think it's important to note that although the story itself might not have originally been in the book of John, most scholars do believe that this story belongs in Scripture because of the heart of the story. In other words, uh, the story is very much still gospel. Um, it's Jesus presenting his heart to the people. It's Jesus presenting something that he is 100 um, uh, percent. You can read throughout and see the same uh, story of Christ. And so uh, it's gospel. And so what I'll do this morning is try my best to present the gospel to you from this story. Is that, co is that cool? That sound OK. So I don't want to get into the details as to why the story was there. You can look at that on your own or we can come talk later. You can come talk to J Pastor Jody. I'm sure that he will. Um, he would love to get into some deep study with you like that. Um, so when I, as I start this off, let, let's talk about this. I, um, what what is this text actually addressing? Well, it's a problem that everyone, whether you're a Christian in here or not, you've probably had this or have had to deal with this at some time or another. And it's mainly that Jesus, it's, it's how Jesus treats sinners and how we should treat sinners as a result. What, how, how do you deal with this thing, sin? How do you deal with these people that come up to you in sin? And so this passage Jesus shows, as you just saw depicted there, Jesus says that there is no condemnation for those who are in him. Um, however, it doesn't mean that just because that he doesn't condemn doesn't mean that he condones. And so there's this balance. Um, and so and it certainly doesn't mean that we continue to sin. Rather, we're free to not sin. Because Jesus has taken taken the punishment for our sin. We'll talk about that. We'll unpack that as we go along. So in other words, this passage is really all about the balance between the law and grace. And it's, I think, at the crux of the Christian life, right? It's for us to try to understand how to live by the law in grace. Um, so how do we love sinners without loving sin? You guys ever hear that? God loves the sinner but hates the sin. How do we love sinners um, without loving sin? So it, it, I, again, it's the biggest challenge that I believe um, plagues the church today. Um, and the two problems that come along with this are, are, are easy to kind of relate to, right? One of them is, is condemning, in other words, condemnation, right? How do we, you know, we can shun people, we can shame people. So condemning, and then the other one is condoning. And so I'll talk a little bit about both of those here by way 
of introduction. So I bring up con- condemnation first because I think it's the easiest to relate to. How many of you guys have ever um, had, you know, these types of people that would um, pretty much use everything, always looking at your behavior, always pointing out what you're doing wrong according to the Bible, right? You guys ever had those people? Maybe you're one of them. Don't raise your hand. Or maybe raise your hand and then put it down quickly. Um, But condemnation is basically using God's law to try to point out sin in order to shame or guilt someone into repent. I'm going to say that again. Condemnation is using God's law to try to point out sin in order to shame or guilt someone into repentance. And at the heart of condemnation is God's law. So, so what's the problem with this? Why, why can't we live this way? Why is it bad to condemn? Well, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. It says, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. By the works of the law, no human being will be justified. So you can't point someone to the law with the expectation that they're going to receive Christ or be made right in the sight of Christ just by pointing out things that the Bible says are are things that we're supposed to be doing. And so the problem with this approach, according to Scripture, is that the law only reveals our sin and our inability to keep it. So the law alone might produce sorrow or repentance, but The law alone can't produce faith in you to believe into Christ. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? I know this might seem a little weird, but we're going to talk about this from a law perspective, from a legal perspective, get into it uh, very practically in in a little bit. So you might stop what you're doing. If somebody presents the law to you, you know, the law of God or, or, or some type of moral principle, you might stop doing what you're doing for a little while, but you'll realize soon that you haven't experienced true repentance. You'll just have modified your behavior. And you'll realize that you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner at heart in your nature. So the law always condemns, and this is what we're told the religious people of this day are doing to the woman. John chapter 8, we just read it, verses 3 through 5. It says, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? So they used the law here to condemn her. But again, the problem is that the law only points out sin. It only brings the shame of what she does. Now, not all shame is bad, right? There are, are, I think, two types of shame that we could think of here. There's a shame that leads to condemnation. There's a shame that leads to rejection. There's a shame that leads to depression to the point to where I'm not accepted. I'm shamed. I'm so ashamed I can't show my face. And then there's a shame that leads to repentance. I'm sorry. I'm ashamed of what I did. And I need to go and face the Lord and face the consequences for what has just transpired. And so the latter is not the type of shame that we're called to practice, but it is indeed the practice that these Pharisees and scribes are leading her to. So shame for condemnation's sake only leads to what? Condemnation. And so imagine what this does to the one being condemned. Put yourself for one second. One of the reasons why I wanted to show that is put yourself in that woman's shoes. You saw... Can you imagine everybody just looking at you and being thrown in there and um, people having rocks and stones about to throw on you? Um, It leads you to believe one thing and one thing only. You're a sinner. Now, that's true. By the way, what she was accused of was true. What these men were accusing this woman of was true, but that's not the end of the story. And so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But using the law for condemnation's sake will inevitably lead to someone believing that they're such a sinner that they'll never be good enough for God. That's what it leads to. You end up convincing yourself that you'll never be able to be a Christian because you'll never be able to live up to the righteous requirements that God puts on all you Christian people. I, for one, I believe this lie 
my own on my own for years. Just in this in the in the same spirit of confession for Jody, right? I, I the law was regularly preached in my life and it didn't lead me to God at all. When the law is preached to you, you're either going to rebel or you're going to run. And I did that. I did the opposite. I decided I this is how I justified it in my head, right? I don't want to be a hypocrite like all these so-called Christians around me. And so I decided I'm just not going to come to God. I'm going to remain in my sin because I know that I could never live up to the standards of your little stupid, you know, fish God that you guys follow is what I used to say. And it ultimately led me to rebellion, to exclusion, and to a feeling of shame. Not, not, not the good shame, but the shame that led me not in a good place. So I think we can all agree, just by what I've read and what I've said, that condemning or condemnation, that approach of dealing with people by the law is not a good thing. Can we say amen to that? But there's another way that we tend to deal with sin, especially in our day and age here, and you go with me here in, in this little reformed world that we live in. There's another problem that I think is plaguing the church, and this one is called condoning. And so we have condemnation, and then we have condoning. Condoning is when we see sin and say nothing about it and accept it. Many Christians in the, day, in, in the church today, including this very church here, The Journey, have come to a place where sin is not exposed for fear of ostracizing our fellow brothers and sisters or because we feel we have no right to judge. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and, and he was commenting, and I agree, that there's this like neo-Calvinistic movement that's going on that, that, that's made the church into a place where we simply diagnose our sins by some little idol. We put an idol to it and we think it's okay. Um... And we, we, we move on from there as if there's nothing wrong with sin or idolatry. We have this me too mentality. Does that make sense? Oh, you struggle with gossip. Oh, that's just your idol of control. I struggle with that too. It's okay. Oh, you're holding a grudge against someone. That's just your idol of pride. It's okay. We all struggle with unforgiveness somehow and pride. Oh, you get drunk every time you're at a party. Well, I'm no judge I'm, I, I'm no better than you, so I can't judge you. But where's accountability there? You see, the Bible calls us to put away the desires of the flesh. It calls us to live a life of worship. It calls us to holy living. And so there's this balance, right? This balance of the law and the balance of grace. And this is the way, in, in this passage, Jesus deals with us with the way we're going to deal with this in every aspect of our life. How do we deal with law and grace with our children? How do we deal with law and grace with our brothers and sisters? How do we deal with law and grace with our spouses, with our co-workers, with everybody around us? But guys, parents, more especially with your children, this is a difficult, difficult thing, right? Because we want to love our children. We want to be graceful to our children. But they break the law, seems like, <laughs> constantly. And, and uh, yeah. It's a tough, it's a tough uh, dance to dance. So where is um, accountability? So let me rephrase the, the, the question. The real question is, where is the balance between law and grace? So the passage today addresses this. Balancing law and grace, living with sin and around sin without condoning sin, and practicing accountability without condemnation. Those are the three things I think Jesus teaches us in this passage, and there are two ways that I want to talk to you guys about today that, that, he, that he points out that, uh, that he teaches us based on what he says. Number one is Jesus chastises the comfortable and comforts the chastised. Let me repeat that. Jesus chastises the comfortable and comforts the chastised. And secondly, he shows that conquering sin is possible. If we understand the order of things, meaning our identity. So number one, Jesus chastises the comfortable and comforts the chastised. If you look at verses 7 through 9 of the passage we just read, it says, And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Once again, he bent down. 
And he wrote on the ground, but when he heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. It goes without saying that none of us in this room probably would have dared cast the stone at this woman, correct? Maybe, I don't know. But it's important that we don't miss what's happening. These folks were ready to stone her because they had forgotten that they too were sinners. And remember the point that I'm making here, that Jesus chastises the comfortable. They had gotten comfortable in their own sinfulness. Perhaps they felt that their sin wasn't as bad as her. After all, she was sexually sinning, right? And this is far worse than any other thing you can possibly do, according to who? And so that's sarcasm. So you ever feel that way? You ever feel like, you know, maybe uh, at least I, I may not be, I may be this, but at least I'm not that. Right? And so we treat people with this, uh, with this thing. And what Jesus reminds us of is that we are just as sinful. They were just as sinful as she was. So don't miss what he's saying. L when he says, let he who is within, without sin cast the first stone, he's not saying that only sinless people can judge. That would be silly, right? We'd never have a judicial system if he were actually saying that. What he's saying is that they too were sinning, not had sin, but were currently presently sinning. Let me explain what I mean. In the law of Moses, in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, it says this. If a woman commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, read this with me, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. What evidence is missing from the story we just saw? Where's the guy? Where's the man? See, according to the scriptures, both parties needed to be there. But there's only one. So they're committing right then and there a sin. And so they're like, uh, you need to stone her for her sin, but don't look at our sin of falsely accusing someone or bringing false charges against someone or the sin of partiality in which we only look at one party and not the two. So where was the trial? Where was the jury that, that found her guilty? Where was, where was the man was merely some Pharisees and scribes who brought this woman before Jesus to see if he would succumb to the pressure of trying to prove himself to them. But they were so focused on trying to catch, G catch Jesus and they were so focused on the sin of this woman that they forgot their own sin. And they forgot that it says in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 16, 15 and 16, which they would have had access to. It says, you shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. They hadn't done this. And so not only were they sinners, but they were actively sinning as they brought this woman before them. Does that make sense? So basically what Jesus is saying is you're accusing this woman, but your very charges are contrary to God's law. So you have no right. Notice he didn't say that. All he did was like sit down and draw on the ground. Like, you guys are so stupid. You're not, you're not worthy of me saying this. In other words, they were using the law falsely to try to shame and humiliate this woman. And Jesus knew this, and he chastises them for it. You see, when you forget you're a sinner... When you get comfortable in your sin, that's when Jesus shows up and he rebukes, he chastises you. When you fail to call out your own sin, Jesus calls you out for it. He must, because he doesn't condone sin. So the point is that no one is without sin, and this is why no one, none of us can judge rightly, right? This is why we can't use the law to condemn, because we're all lawbreakers, active lawbreakers. How many of you like to be known as the current struggler of whatever? I used to be a, I'm a, I'm a former alcoholic. No one likes to be known as the alcoholic. 
But the, the reality is that we struggle with alcoholism. The, struggle, the reality is we struggle with gossip. The reality is we struggle with pride, with unforgiveness, with bitterness. I used to be bitter, I want to say. I'm no longer. Why? Do you actively practice that now? This is what Jesus is pointing out. We're all lawbreakers. And so what do they do? They drop their stones and they walk away. Now, I'm pretty sure when these guys dropped their stones and they walked away, they walked away in what Jody preached about last week. They walked away in retrospection. As we look at this, we look, they looked back, right? They probably thought about all the times they had forgotten to look at their own sin before accusing someone else of sin. Can you relate to that? And so let me ask you a few questions in retrospect. What stones, this is a question that Bill asked me the other day, what stones are you holding on to that you need to drop and walk away from? What have you failed to forgive because you've forgotten how forgiven you are? Who have you talked about? Have you talked about a brother or sister behind their backs because you don't agree with them, not realizing that you're gossiping in the process? Have you gotten so comfortable in your Christianity that you think you're without sin? Jesus chastises the comfortable. But the good news is that he doesn't only chastise the comfortable, he also comforts the chastised. Amen to that second part, huh? John chapter 8, verse 9 through 11, which we just read, it says, And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him, and he stood up to, and he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said the best words she's ever heard in her life. Neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on sin no more. <laughs> That's so awesome. My, my pelos are standing. Um, after everyone drops their stones, he's left with her and he gives her these words. No one here condemns you. I definitely don't condemn you. And although she'd been condemned, although she'd been shamed, although she'd been chastised by the religious people of the day, Jesus comes along and comforts her. Imagine receiving those words. Put yourself in this woman's place. Neither do I condemn you. What an amazing declaration of righteousness. Neither do I condemn you. According to the law, this woman had indeed sinned. I'll get, I'll get into that in a second. Notice, right, he says go and sin no more. The fact that he said go sin no more means that she had actually been sinning. Let's not get it twisted, right? It's not like Jesus said, oh, you, they said you were sinning. I say you weren't sinning. That's not, that's not the logic that Jesus is using. According to the law, this woman had sinned. You couldn't accuse anybody without two or three witnesses. She was guilty. She was caught in the act. But Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Why? Not because she wasn't guilty, but because he would later take that guilt on himself. He didn't condemn her because he would later be condemned for her. He didn't cast stones and let her be stoned to death because he would later die for her. And so he comforts her, not only for saving her life physically but at that very moment was pointing to a much deeper salvation one that we all need salvation of our spirits and that my friends is true comfort that is true true comfort much more comfort than the law could ever provide amen and so you know what happens we forget we forget this so in retrospect have you forgotten the price Jesus paid to save you from condemnation? Uh, I have and I do. And I'm not saying it like, yeah, I do that all the time. It's cool. I'm saying that shamefully. Has the cross become some mere act of kindness that happened a long time ago? Or is the cross real to you today? You see, salvation is free, but it's only free for the one receiving it. Someone paid for our salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Can somebody say hallelujah to that? 
Have we forgotten this? Is this good news to you today or is it history? Think about a moment in your life. Think about the best possible moment you can remember. The most exciting day of your life. Maybe, maybe it was your wedding day. Maybe it was the birth of a child. Maybe it was your favorite sport team winning, sports team winning. You know, um, whatever, a championship. Think about the joy you felt that day at that very moment. Think about the way you acted. Did the world around you matter? Not really, right? We tend to live carefree in those moments, don't we? We tend to be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Look how they're going to be partying in Cleveland tonight probably, the way things are going in the World Series. They're going to be like, oh my gosh, my team won. It's fantastic. It's uh, And the euphoria and the joy and all of that stuff that, that, that surrounds us makes us carefree. We don't care about the world. If something were to be like, hey, you know what? Somebody just robbed your bank account. I don't care. The Indians won. Why? Because joy abounds. We have a word for these moments, though. You know what they're called? Memories in history. They're called history. But here's a sad truth that I'm guilty of, and, and, I, and I think I, I speak for us as a collective body that I think we're guilty of. I think we've let the gospel become history. Some distant memory. But, but you see, the gospel is called good news. And so news is relevant for the day, Right? You ever, have, have you, what's the last time you guys read last year's newspaper today and called it news? So it's only good news if it's relevant today. Otherwise, it's history. And so let me ask you a question. In retrospect, is the gospel news to you today or is it history? If it's history, then you might remember the cross and smile and, and be grateful. But if it's news, then it's for today and that same joy that, that same, oh, that same, oh my God, that same experience that you feel when you know, when you first heard, when you found out that you were saved from your sin, from the penalty of death, from going to the cross, that same excitement will bubble up on you every day, right? Right here in this moment. And so it'll produce joy today. So this is why it's crucial that we speak the gospel to one another daily. Why? So that we'll experience the joy of the gospel so that it'll be news, daily news, not history. Amen? Amen. So, that's the role of a Christian. The role of a Christian is not reminding one another of sin. It's reminding one another of the one who paid the penalty for sin. Amen? Secondly, what does he do? He shows us, so the first thing I showed you is that he chastises the comfortable and he comforts the chastised. Secondly, what does he do? Wrapping up here. Not really, but I want to start wrapping up. I'll begin to think about wrapping up. Maybe. He shows, I maybe will think about, um, he shows that conquering sin is possible if we understand our identity. It's important we don't fall into the trap that many tend to fall into when we read this verse. Some people th stop reading this verse where it says, neither do I condemn you, period. But, but the passage doesn't stop there. In verse 8, 11, it says, neither do I condemn you, go, and, go now and sin no more. So the, the command, the grace that Jesus gives is not without a response. It's, I condemn you, go and sin no more. So salvation, grace demands a response. Salvation demands a changed life. We are saved from something to something. We're changed from someone to someone. And that something isn't just some future eternal life. It's not like a lot of people would say, well, you know, you were saved so that you would have eternity with God. That's true. But what about the time in between? Because I'm living right now. There's a very present salvation that Jesus calls us to. 
And that, the, the Christian life, is to be lived now, not only later. The day will come when we don't have to struggle with sin anymore. But right now, the struggle of sin is real. We have to live with it. The struggle that we face sin is real. And we have to live with it. How do we live with it? Well, this is why you've heard us say before, we were saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. In other words, salvation is past, present, and future. So how do we respond? We're called to respond in obedience. We're called to sin no more. Grace, salvation calls us to this. And how do we do this? Well, if you don't understand the order of what I just read, you'll miss it completely. You'll keep running to the law instead of running to the cross. You see, in verse 11, when you look at it, look at the order. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on sin no more. It should be like a therefore in between. In other words, because I don't condemn you, you can go off and you can sin no more. The who determines what I do. Remember? I said that to you guys before. So he doesn't say, he doesn't say, sin no more so that I won't condemn you. There's a difference in that. That's running to the law, not running to the cross. But instead, he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Have you ever been spared from something that was like perhaps life-threatening? Maybe even something like, maybe you were speeding, you got a warning ticket from the police instead of the, the actual ticket. That's happened to me many times. Um, to Anna's chagrin, you were speeding again. Um, but right when you like got forgiven of that ticket, did you like speed away? <laughs> Like, you know, I mean, that'd be awesome, right? Like, maybe I should try that. Just see what happens. <laughs> I do know what would happen. That's why I said, let me try it. Um, but we don't, do we? Why? Because we realize, we understand what just happened. What we were just spared from informs my behavior from here on out. So when you forget that you've been spared, what happens? You, you. You do it again, right? And so that's the way it is with conquering sin. Sin can be conquered as long as you know that it's not something that, that you have to do to, to free, free yourself from condemnation. So people can change, as the book says, as long as you understand your identity. And so I don't obey so that I'm not condemned. That's living under the law. I I'm free to obey because I'm not condemned, if that makes sense. That's living under grace. And so as I've said before, our identity informs our behavior, our who informs what we do. It's, it, it's, it's what we are that makes us um, act and respond. So how do we respond to this every day? Now, now I'm closing. Um, how do we apply this to our everyday lives? Well, we have to walk the delicate balance of grace and truth. We have to understand that this isn't an easy thing, right? I'm not telling you guys that, that, that I have the secret and that I've just unveiled the secret to you. Just, just live by the cross. Remember the cross and everything will be okay. It's not. There's a practicality about this that makes it difficult and hard and, and, and you know, and here's some practical things. But if our identity informs our behavior, then what do we need to be doing daily? Reminding one another of our identity, right? And so from a practical standpoint, here's what we can glean from this passage. Here's how we can remind one another daily of our identities. And they all start with the letter R. Not start, but they're all brought to you today by the letter R. Number one is recognize. Recognize your need and your thirst, as Jody mentioned last week, for Christ and for his work of redemption. You must. These men who had brought this woman before them, they had forgotten their thirst. They were like, oh, she's thirsty. We're, we're good. We're full to the rim. Don't need anything else. Re recognize your need for Christ and his work of redemption. Second, remember. 
Remember your identity. Notice the order of things. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. If you, I, I have a, a, a handout that I want to give you guys here. It's, a, it's not anything spectacular. It's an it's a, uh, article written by a, a pastor named Josh Mulvihill. He's, um, he's a pastor of children's and families out in Grace Church. I'll give it to you guys right after I'm done here. But uh, it's also on the sermon's transcript. So for the, those of you guys listening online, you can download the sermon transcript and you can see that it's the last two pages of the sermon transcript. But uh, it talks about identity. Right? The, the guy goes into how, uh, how our identity is rooted. God, son, our, us as family. So read it. Uh, I'll pass it out here in a sec. So remember your identity. Second, I mean, thir- second, uh, remind, third, so first is recognize, second is remember. Third is remind, remind one another of your identity and remind them to turn to the cross, not to the law when dealing with, str- dealing with and struggling with sin. All right, I know this happens not only in the church at large, but it should happen in your missional communities and most certainly, guys, it should be, ladies, it should be happening in your DNA groups. This is where, right, the, the deep uh, heart work is, is, is done, right? Not God's doing the heart work, but you're doing the, the, uh, the reminding. Um, fourth, respond. Respond with your identity as a forgiven, redeemed child of Christ that demands a response. What's the response? Worship. The response is obedience. But listen, it's not obedience or worship out of obligation for what jesus has done it's response or obedience out of gratitude for what jesus has done and that's a totally different way of looking at it and the last r is pray see how i did that there pray pray it's the holy spirit's job to convict John chapter 16, verses 7 and 8. I want to remind you of something here today. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away, for if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, read this with me, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteous judgment. Who will convict the world? Jose Mateo, Jody May, Bill Alderson, anybody. No, the Holy Spirit's job is to convict. Now we look at that word and we think, oh man, conviction, that's not a cool thing. He's also the comforter, is he not? But it's conviction that leads to repentance. It's conviction to let you know that, hey, there's something wrong here. And let me remind you of the one who paid for that wrong so that you would return to him. But I don't think it can be clear, more clear whose job it is to convict. But it's our job to, as I said a minute ago, to pray for one another. So let's put our stones down, walk away, trusting that Jesus has redeemed and offers no condemnation. Amen. So let me leave you with this passage. I want to encourage you with this passage of Scripture. We all know it. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Listen to them, follow along, and pray that you would believe them. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Think about that. You've been set free to obey. You're not, you're not a captive of obedience. You're free to obey. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in who? In us. Let's rejoice in the Lord for this. Let's pray. Father, we all have this struggle that is just real and and difficult when sin comes creeping, 
knocking at our door. Our first inclination is to battle that sin with the law. Not realizing, forgetting that you've battled that sin, not with the law, but at the cross. And you won. And you won that for us. So Lord, as we sit here today, as we stand here today, I pray that you would give us, as Christians, give us the grace to be gracious. Give us the grace to use the law in a manner that points us to your holiness and that alone. To use the law as as a tool by which we can see sin and run to Christ. Forgive us for the times in which we've stood in the place of judgment and looked down on people and shamed people and condemned people for their sin. God, remind us daily that you don't condemn us for ours. Remind us daily who we are so that we would in turn respond and live out this life in joy and in worship and in obedience. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Um, We're going to have a time of communion. I I would uh, have you guys just pass these down. There's not a lot of copies, so just keep one per family, I guess, and, uh, and share it. But yeah.